World War II left Berlin a city in ruins. Its population, mostly women and children, labored to pick up the pieces. We were a pack of kids all the time. The grown-ups weren't there. I mean, they were either trying to find some food or get life sort of going. Berlin was divided into four sectors, each controlled by one of the World War II allies. The Soviet sector alone became East Berlin, while the other three, the French, British, and American sectors, made up West Berlin. East Berlin was extremely poor. People wore pretty ragged clothes. There was very little building. And uh, the differences got sharper and sharper as the years went by. In 1946, the Americans launched a radio operation to reach all Berliners. Radio in the American sector was simply called RIAS. Everybody was listening to it. All the windows were open and you didn't miss a piece because everybody was listening to the same thing. RIAS newscasts had a singular mission. To give clear, absolutely undisputable correct news. Rias was a threat to communist rule because it broadcast information into East Germany that often contradicted Soviet propaganda. They had no proper free press. You know, the newspapers were, were, were Russian-owned, Russian-controlled, occupation, all this. Uh, the radio station, the same thing. The possibility of nuclear war between the U.S. and the Soviet Union threatened the entire world. And both of the superpowers had troops in Berlin. One really felt that if there was going to be a third world war, that's where it would begin, over Berlin. In June of 1953, a labor dispute in East Germany spilled into the streets and onto the news. Police cars saw this procession of workers and just stopped and went away. And for about four hours that afternoon, these people were really in control of the city. They marched all around. This protest was the first serious challenge to Soviet rule in East Germany. We got word from Washington, be very quiet. Don't do anything. You can report on it, whatever you want to but never tell the people they should make an uprise. I said, why? Because take the case that the Soviets intervene. Can you exclude that their tanks will come into West Berlin too? I said, well, this is politically impossible. Can you guarantee? No, of course not. June 17th. The Soviets crushed the uprising with tanks. But the journalists at Rias saw that their broadcasts had more power than they knew. For the first time, we realized that an electronic medium is able, in a given situation, to change the political situation. The information upon which a farmer or, or an engineer or a physician, you know, based his decision to leave was, of course, information from the, from the free press. And that was basically radio. In ever-increasing numbers, refugees from the eastern zone of Berlin stream to the western centers. Sometimes at the rate of 2,000 daily, they make their way from behind the Iron Curtain the East German government forced Khrushchev to do something because they didn't lose millions of people, they lost millions of the best people. This East German brain drain was a true crisis for Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev, but no one expected his radical response. It was a drastic remedy that took place in Berlin and changed world politics for a generation. Before there was a wall, travel between East and West Berlin was controlled at checkpoints, where border guards scrutinized passports of people driving or walking through the Iron Curtain. The East Germans hint that tomorrow they may move to seal this border completely to all refugees. 
And I was just getting out of the room when the telephone rang. And I answered it, and a voice just said, Game Nix is in bed for you tonight. Please don't go to bed tonight. Something's going to happen. 2 a.m. The Brandenburg Gate between East and West Berlin. The sound of jackhammers erupts in the night. Suddenly, East German police appear, tear up the sidewalks and streets, begin to sink concrete posts and string barbed wire along the border. There were these army people rolling barbed wire rolls across the road. I said, <coughs> what are you doing here? He said, we are building the war. Even before the Berlin Wall was completed and fortified, East Germans risked life and limb to escape communist rule and live free in the West. August 17, 1962, 18-year-old Peter Fechter scrambled up the wall towards freedom. East German border guards shot him in the back. We were standing on the western side of the wall. And on the other side of the wall was this voice saying, help, 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 in German, Hilfe, Hilfe. And he was obviously dying. Peter Fechter bled to death after lying within sight of US soldiers for almost an hour. Berliners wondered why the Americans didn't rescue him. Well, the answer was that nobody's going to start an incident on the wall. It might possibly escalate, lead to World War III. All this was forgotten in the moment in which the president came. It was unbelievable. Today, in the world of freedom, the proudest boast is, Ich bin ein Berliner. Reassured of U.S. commitment, three West Berliners continued to assist escapes from the East, and media coverage showed the world the links to which people would go to flee communism. Camera crews are harassed by reflecting mirrors in the hands of East German police, and water hoses are played on equipment. Nevertheless, our reporters are able to come up with some remarkable pictures, despite these hazards. In 1962, NBC paid for access to a tunnel dig to bring the drama of tunnel escape to television. I said, okay, make a deal with them that we will supply material. They have to give us a bill and we will pay it. And in return, we have the right to film, period. And by the time they were through, the cellar from which they dug was full of dirt to the ceiling. Well, that was one of the difficultest parts to find the right place to start. We dig for about seven months, around the clock. Hasso Herschel had escaped East Germany using a fake passport. His relatives were among the 28 people who used this path to freedom under the Iron Curtain. And 10 minutes later, the door, we opened the door, and my sister came. The Western press covered the life and death drama of escape from East Berlin throughout the Cold War. The East Germans were not kind to people who were planning to escape. They would put them in jail. They would take away their children. It was vicious. It was very clear what the story was, and it was not a story that was terribly flattering to the East German authorities. In 1989, the struggle for freedom behind the Iron Curtain became louder and more organized. Radio and television were able to broadcast that story to audiences on both sides of the Berlin Wall. Soviet Premier Mikhail Gorbachev spoke of glasnost or openness, but in communist East Germany, the Berlin Wall kept the border locked tight. Eric Honecker's visit to West Germany does not change the fact of this wall which divides Berlin, nor does it change his standing orders 
for those guards in the tower behind me to shoot on sight anyone who tries to escape East Germany. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. For Western news crews, the wall was no obstacle to broadcasting information into East Germany. Every night they would watch their television coming from West Germany and they would undertake what did they call Geistige Republikflucht, which is a kind of intellectual um, escape from the Republic. So every evening, millions of East Germans would escape to West Germany. Intellectual escape was followed by organized protest. And those rallies were videotaped by East Germans who gave the tape to Western news crews. Once again, the communist authorities were unable to keep information from the people. It was just those marches in Leipzig and then they, they grew bigger. And that was, I think, the real, the real engine for what happened afterwards. It is happening every day now in the fields and villages just inside Hungary. Hundreds of East Germans are running for the break in the Iron Curtain. Until a few months ago, they would have been stopped by an electrified fence. But in May, Hungary began cutting down the barbed wire. It was such a symbolic picture. The barbed wire being cut open and enormous amount of running through, you know. Free, 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 and we are free. You know. They weren't thinking about what would happen next. It didn't seem to matter. November 9, 1989, East German spokesman Gunther Schabowski made an announcement so unbelievable it baffled reporters. And therefore, we decided to invoke a ruling which would allow every citizen of the East German Republic to emigrate through East German border posts. And it was like you were hearing something from outer space. We were all staring at each other, and there was a guy from the Associated Press sitting next to me. He said, did he say what we thought he said? I ran upstairs to do the interview with him, and I remember this vividly. Shabowski pulled the paper out of his pocket, put it down in front of him, took out his glasses. We read it together. I said, you understand the ramifications of this. It is possible for them to go through the wall at some point. It is way. possible for them to go through the border. Freedom to travel. Yes, of course. NBC Nightly News with Tom Brokaw. Tonight, from West Berlin. Good evening, live from the Berlin Wall on the most historic night in this wall's history. What you see behind me is a celebration of this new policy announced today by the East German government that now, for the first time since the wall was erected in 1961, people will be able to move through freely. This crowd has gathered here tonight spontaneously. It did happen so quickly. From the East German side, they have been training water cannon, as you can see. Half a country on foot yeah, to see the other half a country. German police have moved in here, suggesting that they move back, saying that the situation is already complicated enough, but it doesn't seem to make any difference. There used to be a checkpoint before, and I suddenly said, oh my God, I forgot my passport, you know. <laughs> I didn't need it anymore. The way in which people kept on plugging away and telling the truth. That was a real triumph. Without the media, without reporting, the Berlin Wall probably never would have gone up in the first place, and certainly would never have come down.